So I just wanted to, uh, to welcome everybody back. Uh, for those of you that were here um, last week, uh, we were talking about this um, projection and policy analysis system and basically how it's changed relative to what we used to think of as a forecasting and policy analysis system. We talked about the parts uh, related to surveillance, knowing where the economy is, what the underlying forces are, how do we design systems to be able to do that. Today, I think uh, might be more interesting because we're going to be talking about uh, how to think about putting uh, scenarios together with a Mac core kind of macro model. Uh, I'm, we're gonna be using a very stylized model um, that we actually use in, in our courses uh, here at the Better Policy Project. Um, but I think it's, you know, it's, it's a useful little model for sort of illustrating uh, how we think about these sorts of issues. David, uh, David and I go back uh, all the way to New Zealand um, in the early 1990s. So I left the Bank of Canada in 1993 and the first uh, central bank to contact me uh, for help in developing an analytical framework to support inflation targeting was New Zealand. Uh, David wasn't uh, the person that invited me, but he was there when I, when I arrived. And three years later, uh, they developed what came to be known as a forecasting and policy analysis system. So David was there during the development of this thing. He was also there uh, as someone that implemented it and produced uh, uh, forecasts and scenarios uh, for policymakers. Uh, and then he became uh, assistant governor at the Reserve Bank of New Zealand and, and went on to become a policymaker. And of course, over the last decade or so, he's, he's been at, at the BIS uh, doing research on central bank issues. So on that note, I'd like to welcome David um, to say a few opening remarks and, and then to give us uh, his bottom line. Thanks, Doug. So um, given that introduction, it's kind of odd for me to then say that, um, to explain the kind of mission that I want on at the moment and trying to uh, to recruit Doug to join this mission. And the mission is to stop central banks forecasting. Now, that's a pretty um, stark way of putting it. It's as overly stark as you'll find out. Um, but the reason for wanting to, for being concerned about putting forecasts at the center, front and center stage is what you see on the screen, the point that central banks often they usually face many possible futures rather than a singular future. There is not one singular future. Now we've just been through some experiences and we're still living through some experiences which really illustrate that strongly. Beginning of COVID, no way that we could tell when the vaccine was going to arrive, how long we would stay in it. There was the range of reasonable scenarios was huge, was massively wide. The, the Fed, the SCB, other central banks are in not quite as stark positions, but still very stark positions in terms of whether the economies remain stuck near the effective lower bound or they're about to take off. Potentially very, very wide uh, gaps between these scenarios. So what we want to do, what I think central banks should be doing is taking Greenspan's policy as risk management much more seriously. Now that approach doesn't involve producing and communicating a best forecast. Instead, it involves evaluating policy risk and steering uh, like a risk minimization path. The evaluation is still forward looking. It involves projecting a range of possible paths into the future, allowing for different dynamics that might, might be at work. So it involves scenario generation. For this, we need model-based methods. 
policy risk evaluation inherently is going to require being able to process several different ways of thinking about the world, different economic structures, different dynamics uh, around the issues which we think might be most relevant. So Doug's FPAS system, the system that he first developed for us in New Zealand and has been working with ever since, is an ideal platform for this. What I want to do is co-opt that system instead for scenario generation and exploration rather than for forecast production. Hence the shift in the terminology from FPAS forecast to PPAS projection and policy analysis system. When we started to explain this uh, approach, this new um, organization of uh, the analytical work of the central bank in our last session last week, we concentrated, as, as Doug just mentioned, on the, uh, the starting points, the current situation for, uh, for the, the, the range of scenarios that we're going to want to explore. Now, the starting point is never perfectly clear. Very often, it turns out when we look back, there were processes already at work that we had not fully understood, which are going to take the economy in quite different directions. The starting point is critical. But even more important is to be able to think about the range of possible ways in which the economy is going to respond to shocks currently in process. And as I noted, we're in a situation now where there are uh, really interesting alternatives, which Doug is going to illustrate for us uh, as uh, by way of exploring some of the possible, possible different dynamics within the economic system that you would want to consider when doing your policy risk analysis. So Doug, over to you. Okay, <clears throat> so, so the objectives um, for the rest of the talk uh, is to use a small model uh, and some technology that's been developed in Dynair um, to be able to solve these problems so that we can generate these different uh, scenarios that, that David was referring to. So specifically, we're going to use small models uh, with this loss function minimization approach uh, as an illustration for how models can be used to focus on uh, what we think are key policy issues, um, confronting not only people in the United States, but, but also elsewhere. Uh, and we think that uh, this framework could be useful as a basis for policy formulation and, and more consistent communications. Okay, so the key, key word I think is, is consistent that uh, we don't want to deal with the world and, and, and be fictitious and pretend certain things um, and sim oversimplify certain things uh, because that's eventually going to come back and, and haunt us. Okay, so more consistent communications is, is recognizing things uh, like fundamental uncertainty. So to go back to David's point, uh, during COVID, some central banks, for example, they simply couldn't write down the assumptions uh, for something that we would normally think of as a, as a forecast. So they stopped producing forecasts uh, altogether. Okay, so the question is, we want to have a framework where this isn't just an on-off switch, okay, where sometimes you produce forecasts and others you don't, you don't produce forecasts. We want to be able to communicate the implications of uncertainty uh, and the dialogue inside the central bank uh, as clearly as possible so that we can make monetary policy as predictable as possible. Um, and we're also gonna show, hopefully, um, you'll see that I'm not using very many resources, uh, virtually myself and some other people that I'm in the process of teaching during, uh, during our summer school. Um, so maybe uh, some of them might actually be in the audience. So uh, if they wanna pop in with some scenarios that they've created uh, over the last few weeks, then, then uh, that would be fun. So we're going to show that this framework doesn't require massive resources to implement that actually by thinking about problems clearly uh, 
uh, it doesn't take very many resources at all. Now that opens the possibility for central banks that have massive amounts of resources uh, into doing all the stuff that I'm talking about much better, uh, including studying the, the range of possibilities that's sort of behind um, fleshing out what is in David's uh, vision about uh, how we should be doing this inside uh, central banks and so on. So a little model that, that I'm gonna work with is gonna be a closed economy model. Uh, it's not gonna be a DSGE model, uh, but it's gonna have all the policy insights or most of the major policy insights of a DSGE model. The reason I'm not using DSGE model is not because we can't, because obviously we have DSGE models and you know of, of pretty enormous sophistication and complexity, but for the purpose of <clears throat> what I'm focusing on um, today, we simply just don't need it. Um, so I'm gonna be working on something simpler <clears throat> that I think is allows me to kind of focus in on what I think some of the, the key issues are for, for the US right now and for monetary policy in the US. Now, um, the little model I'm actually gonna use uh, was published in a working paper back in 2015 that was used as part of the Article 4 uh, to basically push the idea that it would be a good idea for the Fed to plan an overshoot, which effectively is what they're doing now. Okay, so this was a, a suggestion that we had made back in 2015, but our proposed modest overshoot was modest, okay, they were, you know, projecting a slight overshoot in inflation. But the same logic was there um, that's applicable today and why the Fed is pushing an overshoot. And that is, we wanna get the economy away from a big output gap where there's significant uh, underutilization of resources and unemployment and so on. And we wanna get the, the, the economy away from that spot as quickly as possible. Um, and number two, if we have to use inflation overshooting to get real interest rates down to accomplish that, no problem. Okay, you know we're getting the real economy going, and and there's gonna it's gonna necessitate a little bit of an overshoot. So this was pushing the idea, but in addition, it said <clears throat> one of the reasons for not only getting out of the, uh, a period of unemployment quickly. Uh, is that you'll eventually end up with higher interest rates because you'll have higher inflation and that's going to give you policy space in the future. Uh, so one of the reasons for having aggressive policies to overshoot is that you can guard against uh, getting stuck in a low inflation trap where there are significant risks of deflation. Uh, and so you, you, know, you try to get inflation up as quickly as possible. Now, we're going to be thinking... Um, for drawing the line for the interest rate, the Fed funds rate, we're gonna be using um, a loss function minimization approach. So we're going to be minimizing this loss function given a structure of the economy, given certain assumptions about what shocks are, uh, what the starting point value for the economy is, all those things. We're gonna draw uh, the optimal uh, path for the interest rate uh, that gets us our desirable objectives. Now, our desirable objectives in the loss function in period T plus I are year on year inflation minus the 2% target with a weight of one. Okay, so that's standard. The second term is not standard. Um, usually we have the output gap uh, squared uh, where the policymaker cares about both positive and negative output gaps to be able to, to draw lines that are more consistent with uh, how the Fed behaves now uh, and how they communicate. I think it's better basically just to put the negative output gaps uh, in the loss function. So this would be saying that we care about unemployment. Um, you know, we're not concerned about allowing the economy to overheat. Um, it's a different kind of world thinking about overheating and the welfare implications of that than an economy that is plagued with high unemployment and persistent unemployment. And so there's, there's a good real world aspect behind, I think, 
this kind of loss function um, and how it could be interpreted as implementing uh, the dual mandate. And then of course, there's a change in interest rate term, which is simply just to draw smooth lines uh, for the policy rate. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about that, but it's explained in our, in our papers and so on. And then there's this price level gap. And for this thing right here, I want you to completely ignore it because it would bring in technical mumbo jumbo like price level targeting and average inflation targeting. And rather than get into that stuff, I just want to ignore it until I get to the scenarios. And then I'll show you what I'm using this price level gap thing for in terms of producing scenarios that I think have a, well, a nice uh, path for the, for the Fed funds rate, conditional, of course, on all the other assumptions that go into the, into the scenario and so on. Okay, so we're gonna be using loss minimization. Um, we have papers on this that show that obviously, you know, since the global financial crisis, the gaps, the output gaps have gotten so big in some years that you simply just could not reflect that with standard Taylor rules or even forward-looking Taylor rules, unless you had gigantic time varying weights on things like the output gap, okay? so. So I'm arguing that this loss function approach is not only better for a prescriptive tool, but it's also better uh, as a positive tool in the sense that you can produce things that are more plausible. Uh, well. and, and Doug is crucial for doing scenario analysis where in your scenarios, you're changing the structure of the economy. And this is a point that Lars Svensson was, has been strong on. Uh, any instrument rule of a tailored type you kind of uh, back that out of your understanding of what you're trying to achieve and your understanding of the economy. Now, if either of those change, the calibration of the rule, even the structure of the rule is gonna change. So working with a, uh, an instrument rule, like a Taylor rule, uh, is not robust to the changes in the scenarios that you're going to run through the system. You need to come from a loss minimization approach. So this is a very good point. Um, so the problem that we're going to be solving, uh, the mathematics, uh, the description of the mathematical problem is referred to as a, a mixed complementarity problem. So this is a problem that every economist in your central bank should understand every, I would argue even every policymaker should understand the basic, the basic idea here. But a mixed complementarity problem starts off with a, a loss minimization uh, approach for describing the policy problem, which is here. And then of course, there is then a collection of equations. Some of them are linear or approximately linear. And then some of them might have more significant nonlinearities, such as convexity in the Phillips curve, which is going to turn out to be really important for us talking about overheating in the United States and so on, but also the potential loss uh, in credibility, which could change the inflation dynamics. And then, of course, if you have a, a minimization approach calculating the path for the interest rate and and the policymaker knows that information, they can factor that into the, the desirable path for the, for the Fed funds rate in line with the assumptions of the model. Now, it's also perfectly general in the sense that you can also consider situations where the policymaker thinks the world is one way and the world turns out to be another way. So they could be basing their interest rates on the wrong model, but, but the point is that the, the technique is, is very general. And then the last thing that makes a mixed complementarity problem um, is a nasty occasionally binding constraint like the effect of lower bound and interest rates. So in our case, we're gonna have a standard monetary problem where the loss function is in terms of output and inflation. We're gonna have an aggregate demand function that's a function of real interest rates. We're gonna have an inflation equation that's a function of the output gap plus credibility. Um, and we're gonna have this nasty 
uh, occasionally binding constraint that we call the effective lower bound uh, on interest rates. Now, if you think of all policy problems, uh, they will they will tend to be mixed complementarity problems. So they'll have some nonlinearities in there. Sometimes they'll be nasty, like the effect of lower bound on interest rates, where it, it becomes an inequality restriction. And then it'll have some equations that are either linear or approximately linear. Um, well, I guess like the examples <laughs> of the Czech National Bank and the Swiss National Bank and using. Uh, policy instruments such as uh, exchange rate uh, floors um, act like um, these uh, these constraints, not so parts, occasionally binding constraints, which give you exit problems as well as modeling problems. Yeah, so, so the policy solution to running into the effect of lower bound on interest rates is actually usually uh, the uh, opposite of it, but also an inequality restriction. So for example, yeah. an exchange rate floor, like what they did in the Czech Republic, which where they told people what the exit strategy was as soon as they implemented the policy, okay? So that's a policy that, that has a limited duration, right? It's designed to get in there, stimulate the economy, get inflation going, and then once inflation is durably higher to exit the policy. Now, now there's always a chance that people think, well, if conditions were to become similar to what they were, they might go back to that. And that might actually act as a shock absorber uh, in the system for, you know, for the exchange rate because it could make it depreciate more. But the other example, uh, which is more relevant for rich countries, that can't really think about FX intervention strategies. Uh, so these would be bigger countries would be the whole issue of yield curve caps. And mm -hmm. so all these things we've broken into courses. And so you have the policy problem because of the effect of lower bound that creates the mixed complementarity problem that we're going to be talking about now. And then you have solutions that are also based on mixed complementarity problems where if you do an FX intervention strategy, you have an FX floor for some period of time. Same thing uh, for rich countries, you could do uh, yield curve caps. So it's like you would be fixing how high interest rates could go at the appropriate maturity. Okay, so in other words, this would not be a 10 year maturity that you'd want to be capping 10 year bond yields at, but because you want to assume that your your policy is going to win at the end of the day and that you're doing this as a you know as temporary measures that you're prepared for the exit where long rates are eventually going to have to rise because of higher inflation expectations and so on so anyway um the model this is the model so we have a loss function um and then an output gap equation. Um, and so the output gap equation is equal to uh, 0.57. So there's quite a bit of inertia in the output gap um, dynamics. And there's a, there's a significant weight on the lead. So how is this different from a DSGE model? A DSGE model would have a much larger coefficient on the lead and a smaller coefficient on the lag, okay? And so this is one of the advantages of the, these semi-structural models is that I don't have to do a lot of work to my DSD model to get the kind of dynamics um, that I want, okay? And it turns out I don't actually lose a lot of policy insight either. So then instead of putting the short-term real interest rate on the right-hand side, we're gonna have uh, a real, a weighted a real market interest rate of different maturities. Okay, so this is another area where there's uncertainty in the original paper that it was referring to that this is based on. Uh, we had maturities that considered uh, floating debt, uh, one year debt, three year debt and five year debt. Okay, now we're also exploring the possibility of, of incorporating a more FRB uh, US type of maturity structure that would involve even longer term real interest rates uh, affecting aggregate demand uh, con conditions and so on. 
So that's their little model of the output gap. Um, and it's going to have some shocks in it, epsilon y hat, which are going to feature prominently in the story. Uh, our inflation equation is, is going to look a little bit different um, in the sense that we're going to have a convex functional form for the output gap. Um, so this, this Phillips curve, basically, uh, if you're interested really in understanding it, you can send me an email and I'll send you a link to like a presentation just on this pre just on the this convex functional form um, that's buried in my website. Um, but here's one of the examples, I guess, like where you would potentially play with different scenarios. You can change the degree of nonlinearity in this thing. Exactly. So right now, the function assumes that the Phillips curve is really, really flat in the region of of minus two to plus two. So minus two excess supply plus two excess demand. And then the effects of excess demand start to get bigger as we get output gaps that start to rise above two. Okay. And then of course, once we get into 4% excess demand, we start getting lots of inflation. Okay. Now on the other side of that convex Phillips curve, uh, we also have a super flat Phillips curve. Um, and so, of course, that's going to be really helpful for explaining things like why inflation doesn't continue to decline when you suffer a big contraction. Okay. Um, so, if you have like a super flat Phillips curve, um, then it's easy to explain those kinds of observations. And then, of course, backward, forward looking uh, components model. Uh, for inflation. So uh, inflation expectations features very prominently with a weight of 0.7, okay? With only a weight of 0.3 on lagged inflation. In this case, the pi four is year on year inflation. <clears throat> and so when I say that expectations feature very prominently, what I mean by that is that the lagged indexation Okay, is only a number like 0.3. Okay, and so one minus the 0.7. And so what that means is that the expectation part um, is up for grabs in terms of in terms of thinking about the inflation process. Okay, because depending on our model of ET pi four t plus four, that could have big effects in terms of how we how we think about things. Okay, like so then. Uh, we have uh, just, this is just a curve, that, but it's based on unemployment space. Um, so if you're interested in reading about these convex Phillips curves, this is one of the papers that you might wanna look at that's quite, that's quite simple and allows you to think about doing estimation in a consistent way and so on. So this is central bank credibility um, and what central bank credibility does in the model, okay? so. This actually is a part of a model um, that we first developed years and years ago when we were working on countries like Israel and Ghana and so on. Um, and so these were countries that had a track record of high inflation. And so the problem was anchoring inflation from the upside. So this is also applicable to all the stories of the early inflation targeters like New Zealand and so on. Um, and so this idea is that credibility um, is a stock. And so the idea is that in all of our experiments here, we're gonna assume that in the long run, the central bank wins and becomes fully credible. So we wouldn't have to assume that necessarily, but, but that's what we're assuming. And so think of CSS as being EULA one. And so we can see that that if credibility started at some value, like zero, for example, it would converge to one, the steady state value of credibility at 30% uh, per quarter. Okay, so, um, so then how does credibility, what does credibility do? Um, well, it has to do something in the model to make it interesting, uh, rather than just say it's not credible, <laughs> um, it has to be, have some interesting predictions. And so what credibility does in this in this simple model, which, a, which is a simplification of a more complicated model where credibility is endogenous and so on, 
that featured in that work on Israel and Ghana and other countries like India um, is basically an exogenous process for credibility. Um, and so that exogenous process then is going to affect um, how backward looking uh, inflation expectations are. So when credibility is one, uh, then in the second equation, we can see that inflation expectations are exactly equal to the model consistent forecast of inflation. Okay, so we're giving them all the information about the model and the shocks when credibility is equal to one. When credibility is less than one, say if credibility was zero, in this case, inflation expectations over the next year would be equal to what inflation expectations were over the past year. So this is what the pi four T minus one is, uh, plus of course, any shock that happened, okay? Now, the other thing that credibility does in the model, remember credibility is a stock from equation one, is that we can get this ratcheting effect in inflation expectations. So if credibility starts at one, so we can see the last term in the second equation. So if credibility is one, then the term disappears. But if credibility were to fall to zero, then we would be adding a percentage point to that inflation expectation equation. And so that we would describe as a ratcheting up of inflation expectations because uh, if the stock of credibility, if it took a long while to reestablish credibility once it was lost, then you're gonna have this, this bias term in the inflation expectation equation uh, being persistent. And as I said, if you look at the experiences of all the early inflation targeting central banks, they all had this bias in their inflation expectations as measured either in the best survey data that exists, which isn't very many, or information more importantly from financial markets where they have both conventional yielding bonds and index bonds and so on. Okay, but that's the idea is that you can have shocks to credibility um, and we're going to be using that obviously in, a, in looking at booms. Okay, so that's the model. Everybody understands the model. There's only a few equations. Uh, inflation, ex, inflation is a function of inflation expectations and a lag, convex Phillips curve. Uh, inflation expectations are a function of credibility. So how backward looking they are uh, depends on how much credibility there is. Um, and so the stand like to say that the standard model, unfortunately, is a DSG model that presumes credibility. So these comments that I'm making um, about the strength of the monetary transmission mechanism in, in DSG models, these are things that are very relevant, okay, that, you know, these are not the right kind of models for, for addressing the kinds of issues that, that we're trying to address right here, okay, that we need something much more much more flexible than a, than a DSGE model. Um, now, scenarios. So let's talk about some scenarios. Um, so with a model like this, uh, a simple way of thinking about the world. Um, oh, here's a quote by, by Stan Fisher. So anybody know this quote by Stan Fisher? I'd rather have Bob Solo than an econometric model, but I'd rather have Bob Solo with an econometric model than without him. What do you think he meant by that? Does anybody have any idea? Well, I can hazard, hazard a guess there. Um, I, mean, I guess the point is Bob Solo is pretty smart and pretty uh, familiar with the data, but uh, nobody can put things together in their heads. Uh, you need to you need to uh, be able to apply a little bit more structure, a little bit more science in order to be able to unpick these relationships and put them together. Yeah, I would add to that, especially if you're going to uh, if you're going to have to communicate what you did to somebody else. Um, 
so I guess if I was just putting it together and and you know I didn't have to explain what it was I was trying to put together then uh, you know it would be pretty difficult to do without it well it'd be impossible for me to do without a model okay now now the great macroeconomists of a century ago could do things without math and models and stuff just through um, logic uh, but I would say for most people that's doing it without a model is is a uh, is more difficult but okay so scenarios so let's start off um <clears throat> with a scenario without shocks how many times have you ever seen one of those so it used to be uh that people would write down these models and because the models were were problematic um anytime that they like turned the shocks off and then looked at the forecast of the models uh they would they would say maybe we should maybe throw this model away um there were some deep deep problems with the model i think personally as starting off with a model without shocks is kind of informative because if we're using models okay our forecast is going to be a combination of where the economy is starting off okay and what the description of macro dynamics are and what sort of shocks are happening and so i would started it's sort of quite natural to say well let's just let's get to eliminate the shocks um and see what the results are anyway it turns out the story is very very simple um that we start everything in equilibrium so the output gap is zero uh, these are the variables in the model um, thanks to uh, how we can solve uh, mixed complementarity problems in Dynair uh, using divide and conquer strategies when the nasty nonlinearities start to bind. They're not binding here. Uh, they're not very difficult at all because the open gap is only mildly positively. Now, what we're doing here in this scenario is assuming that the open gap is zero. So rather than take you through basically a real forecast where I give you all the initial conditions and we look at where inflation is and try to interpret what the trends are and all that kind of stuff, I'm going to do something a little bit differently in the sense that I'm going to try to build a forecast up or sorry, build a scenario up. Oh my God, I said the forecast. I'm going to build a scenario up. Um, um, and I'm going to tell a story about how I'm putting different things into it. Okay. Um, and so the story is that is that the Fed funds rate is only 0.1. Um, there's no disagreement. The neutral rate is is high, much higher than 0.1, you know, 2% inflation. Fed currently has a long run neutral rate of 0.5. So that's two and a half percent. And so one could just think of a scenario that what if what if the rate were to stay at 0.1 for a year and then gradually rise in line with the rest of the stuff in, in my loss function, okay? And the answer is that, uh, well, because the Fed funds rate is well below the neutral rate, that is providing stimulus to the economy. The real interest rate uh, is, is negative, again, because people think inflation is, is going to be significantly higher uh, in the future. And as a result of that, um, we get this positive output gap, but it's very small. So it's, as you can see in the top left-hand panel, it's only about 1%. Now, the, the assumptions that in this model, so it's sort of like new Keynesian Phillips curve, but augmented for the convex Phillips curve and so on, uh, those assumptions, when you presume credibility, and you can see on the right-hand side, down at the bottom, second from the bottom, there's this thing called credibility. So we're solving the model, assuming credibility is equal to one. So there's a strong presumption in inflation expectations where price setters and wage setters are expecting inflation to follow the model consistent path in the future. Okay, and that uh, actually acts as a very strong shock uh, absorber for the system 
so that you don't get inflation expectations, you know, ratcheting around and so on, right? But that's the basic logic. You can have this expansion in demand, see that the output gap is positive for uh, a couple of years. These are quarters in the, in the figures. So you see it's, it's so positive for about 10 quarters, okay? And you can see if you accumulate that at the lower bottom hand pie side, it's just all extra output that the economy has produced. Uh, that's a standard of that credible new Keynesian Phillips curve that with monetary policy, you know, if you're in, if you drive the economy into a period of excess demand, as long as the thing becomes anchored, the output that you get while the economy is in excess demand, you can bank that. Okay. And so that, that may cause some, some issues with some people uh, in the audience. Uh, but um, that's what that is what it is. It's part of the model. Oh, oh, I got this again. It wants Bob solo. Um, so I think Stan was talking more, you know, more than basically just setting all the shocks equal to zero. I think when he was talking about Bob Solo, he was thinking about maybe thinking about the economy seriously, having a discussion about how the how you think the economy works, where it is, and then translating that information into a model to come up with what David referred to as a as a consistent scenario. So a more interesting scenario, and this is unfortunately one that's very difficult, okay, to to elaborate uh, on uh, with much with much detail um, is the thing that could be in the minds of policymakers that believe that it is really important uh, to overshoot and to not take any risk, make sure the stimulus is is enough, okay, um, to prevent them from getting stuck uh, in a low inflation trap. So, so people in the U.S. You know, so why would they would they keep the Fed funds rate so low, and allow financial markets to believe that it's going to stay low in an environment when the economy goes into excess demand and and inflation's high, and so there must be a reason for that. And one reason is uh, that they're concerned that that if they don't get inflation durably back up to the two percent target given the history of, of past inflation, the fact that it's surprised you know, on the downside for years, that there's a risk that long-term inflation expectations could become de-anchored on the downside. And so just looking at other country experiences, okay, Japan, for example, but more recently the Euro area. So this is just a nice chart that Philip Lane uh, had in one of his speeches that just showed euro area average inflation and long-term inflation expectations. And you can see that when you start to miss on the downside, that your long-term inflation expectations start to ratchet downwards in line with long-term moving averages of past inflation. And this is exactly what we saw uh, in the 1970s, these things, you know, they took a while to take hold. It took a while to lose credibility in that case. Um, so you see- And this indeed, Doug, is a, a scenario, a, a concern that policymakers should be thinking about, right? The, the reference to Japan is exactly right. I mean, you've, you've, you've once you get uh, driven closer to the effect of lower bound by inflation expectations dropping away, you're, you're progressively losing policy space, making the whole problem worse. It's a, it's, a, it's a serious trap you'd want to avoid. You'd want to think about this scenario very seriously. And of course, the other part of the argument in the US is the concerns about hysteresis. And so, the other reason for keeping the foot on the on the accelerator um, is that you want to make sure you get the economy back, that you don't lose people uh, in the process. And again, looking at the experiences of, of uh, the euro area, uh, output is as well and other countries, not just the euro area, but output is has not responded quite as strongly as the U.S. with 
you know, with these highly stimulatory uh, policies and so on. So the question is, you know, how do you represent uh, those risks? How do you represent logically uh, what you policymakers in the US might be concerned about? Um, well, one way to do it is, is to try to create a scenario. Uh, I'll be quite frank with you, I haven't spent very much time uh, crafting this particular scenario. So any, any comments that you, uh, that you have um, would be very much uh, appreciated. But, but one way to think about it simply is to really underscore uh, the word illustrative, um, to think back, and as you don't have to think back very long, it was, it was only last year when we had um, basically news about the virus, news that it, that it had been upgraded to a pandemic. And within a matter of, of days, equity markets fell by over 30%. Um, there was lockdown estimates of forecasts of output, which, which actually are quite amusing to go back. Uh, I haven't told David about them yet. He'll be surprised. Um, were just amazingly like, wrong. Okay, like dynamic factor models got got it off by by a factor of three, the contraction in output. In other words, there were there were three times too small. People that were using back of the envelope calculations uh, were three times too large. So just to give you an idea of um, emphasize some of the points that David was talking about in terms of forecasting, you know, in this kind of uh, environment and so on. But just imagine if something like that happens, we get Delta, Epsilon, uh, we get something that's more infectious, uh, which we already have in, in Delta and so on. But we also get something that requires um, more hospitalization and unfortunately mortality and so on. Since it was really hospitalization and mortality um, that was driving the the motivation for locking down uh, economies. So just imagine we go back into that kind of world, but obviously not as not as disruptive. And so I do a five percent shock here, five percent contraction in the OPA gap. Uh, you could split it. You could say some of it is a shock to potential and aggregate demand. You could do that. I haven't done that, um, uh, but you could you could do that. Uh, and in, anyway, if you do that, uh, the answer uh, is pretty obvious um, that basically you have a big contraction in output. Um, and as a result of that, inflation declines modestly. Um, again, the Phillips curve is very, very flat. And in addition to that, um, you have to keep the interest rate uh, at the effective lower bound point one in this case for a few years okay but but everything everything kind of works out what is hiding here is the fact that if another bad shock were to happen uh, on top of this shock in the future the economy would be it's it would be becoming more and more vulnerable particularly to inflation expectations uh, ratcheting uh, downward uh, in a more persistent way. And unfortunately, asset prices then starting to take on this role of acting as shock amplifiers in the system, as opposed to shock uh, absorbers in the system. So we have two scenarios, one that's completely boring uh, without shocks. And then we have this second uh, scenario um, where it sort of tries to justify why, why you would want to keep interest rates low and really you know, make sure that, that inflation is, has risen and that you do have a symmetric target and so on. Now there's this other uncertainty, uh, which is very, very important. So there's uncertainty about what the output gap is today most estimates have it roughly around zero, maybe a little bit negative, a little bit positive. Okay, but roughly around zero. And now you have this, this uh, low interest rate in combination with three pretty large fiscal packages, um, much of which 
uh, was saved. Okay, so uh, there are estimates of uh, excess savings. I'm not sure I, I like that word, but um, you can think of the, the potentially being pent up demand in the economy that could be quite sizable. Uh, the estimates of excess savings. So the, think of it as a stock of assets that have been maybe saved up to, to do something with uh, is, is somewhere between two and $3 trillion, okay? Depending on, on whose estimates you're looking at and, and how they measure it. Um, another statistic um, that's interesting, I find, is to look at um, the Fed's recent data for Q1 on um, on the household uh, balance sheet, which shows that um, checkable deposits in cash have increased about two point three trillion dollars uh, since two thousand and nineteen. So just think about that. I mean, um, you know, people got all this money, and you know, rather than take the time to shift some of it to time deposits, you know, that would pay a little bit of interest. It's, it's somehow sitting there and there's only three things that it can be used for. Uh, it can be used to, to basically finance consumption purchases uh, in the future. It could be used to invest uh, in things like residential property or or financial assets so that's another possibility or the third possibility is that is that it could be a, a permanent shift in discretionary uh sorry in precautionary savings uh behavior okay now now when you think of that you know the two uh point three trillion dollars sitting there um you know that's one wonders that that we you know if we observe a let me put it this way we observe a gigantic boom a like six months from now you know we look back and we say wow look look at how big that thing was people are going to be looking at that 2.3 trillion dollars and say well oh, wasn't it maybe wasn't it shouldn't have been obvious but anyway so we're doing this scenario where we shock the output gap uh, by 1% in Q3 and 2% uh, in Q4, okay? So uh, obviously it's, we're already in Q3, it's July, okay? Just to give you an idea, since we're starting the economy off at a zero output gap, we'll be, we'll be going from about zero to a little bit more than 1%. So you can see my slide on the left-hand side at the top, you see it's like about almost 2% because there's a multiplier effect. So the shock because monetary is welcoming it, allowing inflation to rise, real interest rates are going down. So the effects of the shock is actually bigger than 1%, okay? Because of monetary policy accommodation. And then of course we get a 2% shock in Q4. So just to give you an idea in terms of growth rates, um, if the output gap goes from zero to one, okay? Then the contribution of the output gap uh, to annualized quarterly growth uh, would be four times that. So if the output gap goes up by one percentage point, goes from zero to one, growth would be four percentage points higher than potential growth, okay? So if potential growth is, so if potential growth is is two and there was a one percentage point increase in the open gap, then it would go from two plus four to six. So this would be consistent with 6% growth in Q3, okay? And a little bit higher growth than that in Q4. So just to put, you, put this in perspective. Doug, you're making us sound pretty big, but you said before that there was like two to three trillion worth of extra cash or extra savings or whatever, and that's 6% of GDP. So you had a one plus 2% shock. Yeah, so that's, when, only, that's only half of the... No, it's it's even smaller than that because it's only in one quarter. So okay. those other estimates are annual. So with 2 trillion, consumption is about 15 trillion, okay? 
And so if you did, um, you know, if you did 1% of that, okay, then that would be, that would represent these shocks. But, but that's not what we're talking, you know, the point is that there's lots and lots of cash, okay? Like yeah. this, this would be making very modest assumptions about, about people spending cash. And plus people have paid down their, you know, their debts. And so you'd have the regular money multi working where the, you know, where the financial system would be, would be creating the real money that's used, but you've got this, this old fashioned money, um, which is cash and uh, checkable deposits that, that looks like it's being waiting, it's waiting there, ready to be used for uh, one of those three things. And if some of it gets used for consumption, there's going to be a boom. Uh, there's also another aspect of that dynamic in the sense that wealth has gone way up. So property prices are high, equities are high. And so you take your typical consumption function, you know, that assumes that you consume a small proportion of that over time. Uh, and you say that some of that is actually in durables and housing, which are stocks. So that's another way for getting this idea that this stuff could propagate for, for a much longer, longer period of time. So there's, there's still a lot more pent up demand than basically what's in these, than what's in these scenarios. And the effects of that pent up demand could be spread over not quarters, but, but potentially a couple of years. Okay. So uh, just something to, something to ponder and so on. So you want to think of what I'm focusing on here is simply there's uncertainty about the demand, the expenditures of these guys that have saved up all this money, right? And so if, if the vaccine is successful in keeping the virus in check and you feel that the vulnerable share of the population has been, has been taken care of, then they will open up and they will start spending on those things that they, you know, that they were constrained uh, that, and couldn't spend on before and so on. Okay. So, but anyway, anybody have any, uh, oh, I was going to talk about the price level thing. So now's the time to talk about that thing. So if we go back to the loss function, um, so I want to explain this. Um, so I want to make it really clear that what I'm doing, I'm not doing, you know, welfare analysis and so on with this, with this loss function. Okay. Uh, what I'm trying to do is just uh, do what we've done all the time, which is to write down a model that basically has something to say about the real world and something that can be used to talk about policy, trying to make policy like, you know, a little better. Okay. So I don't want to think of this loss function as the way we'd normally think about it was we design the perfect model and then we do welfare analysis on it. Okay. So I just want to think of this, this thing as a line drawing machine, someone that can draw efficient lines for Rick Clarida. Okay. When he's sitting there and he's looking at the forecast and he looks at it and he goes, yeah, this is how policy should respond in, in this kind of scenario. Okay. Now there's this price level gap thing um, in the bottom that remember, I refused to explain to you why, why it's there until I got to a scenario. Well, uh, technically, if we let that run all the time, we'd be having price level targeting. Okay, so we'd be always driving the price level back to back to some some line uh, chosen by the Fed, maybe with a two percent slope or whatever, right? Um, but I don't want to do that. Um, I want to th just think about it as something that will control uh, how much I might um, allow inflation to overshoot in any given circumstance. So I just want to think of picking that gap, um, the initial value of the price level gap. Oh, I just want to think of picking some number. Okay. So if I pick some number and I just go, it's minus one. Okay. So minus one, if it's minus one, it means that inflation is going to be able to rise a percentage point higher than the 2% target for say a year. Okay, because that would that would close the one percent uh, gap on the price level. 
Okay, so I just want to use this thing, this price level gap thing. And this is consistent with Clarita's uh, language in his speeches, where he's saying uh, that they're not committed to achieving a price level uh, path targeting line. Okay, so it would really depend on on the circumstances about how much accommodation they're going to allow. Um, and so I want you to think of very think about this this loss function approach very much in that spirit. Okay. And it is um, pretty consistent with average inflation targeting, right? Without having a, a clear starting point for the average. The starting point is a bit state dependent. So on this one, for example, okay, we can see that in this scenario, uh, inflation year on year, the blue line gets up to almost 4%. Okay, and it's pretty, it's pretty systematic. And so this would be consistent with a scenario, and I would be positive in this case, okay, like I would, as opposed to normative, okay, I would say, this would be consistent with the scenario where the Fed allowed inflation to be higher by this amount for this amount of time, okay? And the, the risks associated with that as illustrated in the scenario is that credibility mm -hmm. might fall and that inflation expectations might become more backward looking, okay? Um, so in other words, it's more of a, almost a description of the assumptions that we're putting into. Now, why do we do that? We want to try and we want that exactness so that so that people like David can like look at this and go, uh, no, I've got a different story. Okay. And so I put the stories under uh, the ingredients of scenario X and Y. Okay. I was going to say the ingredients of scenario X, but David doesn't like to produce one scenario because it looks like a forecast. So I have to go the ingredients of scenario of X and Y. But just think of all the things. This is one way of, of kind of compartmentalizing them a little bit is to say shocks that you know influence the output gap and potential uh, inflation expectations is up for grabs. Lots of things could happen. Uh, monetary policy, what are the assumptions that we that we're going to employ about what the you know what the Fed does under various circumstances and so on. Uh, fiscal policy, um, as well as you know what's going on in financial markets. But David, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean these are these are the right categories, but the there's another kind of overlay here which I think is worth thinking about, and that's which of the um, which are, which are the different elements you're bringing in involve non-linearities and which ones are linear um, shocks or linear alternatives. So think, think about your um, credibility induced shift in the inflation expectation process that introduces a non-linearity, but it's not a, it's not a particularly acute one because it evolves smoothly. It's not, for example, the same as you would get if you thought about a, um, a rational inattention model, where basically it's kind of like credibility would remain unaffected until you got to some threshold value. And all of a sudden you would lose a lot of credibility because people would kind of wake up from their inattention and start paying attention and get very doubtful that they understood what was going on and, and get very suspicious. So it's it's in this domain of nonlinear responses where I think a lot of the interesting policy risk analysis would go on. But yes, they would uh, these these questions would fall under the headings that you had up there. So um, I see that there are there, there's at least one person that actually uh, has been playing around with the model, um, but he's, I think he's also kind of busy with other things as well. Uh, Shalva, are you there? You're gonna kill me for mentioning you. <laughs> 
Hi, hi everyone. Yes, I'm here, Doug. Did you have a chance to play around with the model? Yeah, actually, uh, I have been playing uh, around with it. So, so my perspective was to uh, somehow uh, structure my thinking about uh, what it means for for the for other countries like like Georgian economy, for example, that depends on the dollar exchange rate. What it means uh, for us. Uh, how the Fed behaves and what is the uh, the implicit assumptions behind behind the Fed's uh, actual forecast that they have as of now, like I mean this uh, forecast that pub that they publish in uh, in the summary of economic projections, uh, this dot plot report. So I, I was trying somehow to back out the assumptions that the uh, Fed has uh, to to generate the forecast that they have and uh, well. Despite the fact that the model is, quite, is is pretty simple, because it has uh, these kind of non-linearities, it makes uh, this analysis really uh, interesting. So, so my uh, the, the result that I got from playing uh, with the model was uh, that uh, if you somehow uh, if you just uh, start the uh, simulation uh, from the no shock scenario, something that the DAG has shown it actually gives you something that is very similar to the FED's uh, forecast. This is, uh, I mean, uh, when you do not incorporate any, for example, the fiscal stimulus package or the possibility of households spending those cash that Doug was uh, mentioning that they have on the current account uh, deposit. So uh, without all those shocks, uh, then you get some, you get a picture that is uh, uh, pretty much uh, consistent with uh, what, what the FED has. But then, then I, decided to uh, do a couple of simulations uh, uh, that would result in higher inflation. First, I, I tried to incorporate the, uh, this kind of uh, supply bottlenecks that the Fed has been talking about, something uh, that resulted in, in this uh, higher than target inflation. Uh, and the Fed thinks that this is transitory. So I tried to incorporate these uh, transitory inflation shocks uh, in, into the scenario. And this didn't change the picture much. The, I got the slightly steeper increase in the Fed funds rate once this uh, lower bound episode is um, exited. But then I tried to incorporate, incorporate this output gap shock on top of those. And uh, what I got was that for the Fed uh, to actually maintain this uh, price level closer to its implicit target or to maintain inflation on, on average close to 2%. So if they're really committed to average inflation targeting symmetrically. I mean, when inflation has been above the target, if they are committed to undershoot going forward, then this would necessitate uh, quite a sharp increases in the policy rate. So this is the scenario that I got. So this is a bit scary for, for uh, countries like Georgia, uh, countries that uh, have borrowed in, in US dollars, so that if Fed actually decided to increase policy rate uh, this much, if they are actually this committed to this average inflation targeting thing symmetrically, then this could actually tighten the uh, financial conditions globally. We can have something like a taper tantrum that, uh, that we had in 2013. But then, then the question is, uh, what, can, what can be another assumption that we can incorporate that can remedy this so we can uh, have a, a somewhat higher inflation in the US, but Fed not actually not tightening this much. So, I came up with two possible explanations. So uh, one is that the uh, neutral real interest rates could be very low. Uh, and I tried to incorporate this into the model and I got a result, uh, well, not as uh, as uh, optimistic as, as the Fed has, but in, in this scenario, then uh, I have that inflation actually overshoots, uh, but then because nominal, the neutral interest rates are so low, Fed keeping uh, interest rates, uh, close to zero, even with the fiscal stimulus package, this still doesn't uh, lead to persistent inflation overshoots for four years uh, to come. So this somehow resolves this uh, fear that the Fed may have to tighten policy rate too much. So if we have these uh, low real interest rates, uh, neutral interest rates, then uh, we can actually uh, avoid this scenario of Fed uh, sharply increasing the interest rate. So, but that, that also means, uh, so, uh, if we have this kind of scenario that the Fed is actually expecting interest rates to remain low and still not have that much persistent inflation, 
because uh, neutral interest rate is low. So what this means is that, uh, well, the dollar exchange rate should probably be uh, stronger going forward because the interest rate that the Fed needs would be below zero, but because, because of the new, uh, low neutral rate, but because Fed is constrained now, so that means that they may have some appreciation. But another explanation of uh, why Fed may uh, refrain from sharply increasing interest rate is that they may not be as committed to average inflation thing as they uh, would be when inflation is below target. So, I mean, if they see some inflation overshoots, even if the price level is uh, ends up being higher than the 2% path would suggest, and in that case, if uh, Fed will be, would be willing to tolerate this, uh, then this could actually uh, also explain why Fed may not increase uh, interest rate sharply. But this has a starkly different implication for the exchange rate. If the Fed, Fed ends up with higher price level, then uh, the exchange rate, the dollar exchange rate should actually depreciate, not appreciate. So to have this, you know, like uh, for me, the useful takeaway from, from the playing with the model is that to have this kind of uh, understanding how the Fed thinks about this would be better to form expectations. Do they really think that the neutral interest rates are super low so that this is what justifies these interest rates uh, staying at the floor for so long? Or do they really want to generate price levels even higher than the 2% target path would suggest? So it sort of raises the issue of transparency. Um, um, Absolutely. So, so why um, do you think the time has come, David, that that central banks um, should be, you know, putting out these scenarios in in a way that they can be replicated? Because, like, if Shelva had such a difficult time uh, trying to trying to replicate this thing i mean it would be nice to know like what are those ad factors in those in those models uh are they forecasts that are based entirely on the basis of judgment or you know there's we want to be able to dissect and ask you know over time has the science of monetary policy making improved and so on right and because the models and these scenarios are so important should they should central banks publish them yeah, no, absolutely they should publish them. And one of the clear reasons is, is uh, I think, illustrated by the way Shelva was approaching the problem. And that is essentially saying, how can I get the same policy path that I think people are talking about? I think the Fed's been talking about a policy path which has is, remains pretty flat and doesn't move very far. Interest rates remain pretty, pretty, pretty stable. That's... Uh, in the context of the Fed not having said anything about the future of the policy path in terms of saying, here's a projection and a policy consistent uh, policy path that goes with that. Um, it, it, what, what one has in that is, uh, what, what one's reading from this is that um, people, markets in general are inferring something from the loose language that the, the Fed is now using. Um, they can simply wait and wait for developments to arrive and then respond to developments. That's, a, that's essentially the promise that they've made. Not that there's gonna be a particular path of the economy and there's a particular path of interest rates which will follow from that, simply that they're not going to move interest rates until they see the economy having moved in a way which is consistent with achieving their objectives. Uh, it's a backwards looking process for adjusting interest rates. To um, avoid the trap then of the sharp shocks in markets that you're gonna get, in term, including in the exchange rate markets, if it turns out that you're Scenario three C is the um, is the more relevant one, the one that starts to unfold, and the policy follows the revelation that that is the scenario that's unfolding by raising interest rates, shocking everybody. To avoid that, the shock, the Fed should have been talking all along about the possibility of that scenario unfolding, as well as talking about the other scenario which they must be concerned about. Now, in that discussion, the choice of the policy rate, 
is not a question of optimizing for one scenario. It's a question of picking a risk minimization path, given what they think are the major risks and the ones that they're most scared about. It also means if they've been talking in these terms, if you do see um, something which says, hey, these, these price shocks, these, these supply constraints are not temporary, they're not transient, they're persisting, they're actually turning out to be price shocks of markets which are not um, don't have big base effects in terms of the price adjustment process. Uh, that the um, supply supply chains are not able to resolve the problems as rapidly as they were early in the COVID crisis, crisis so that the, the supply constraints are going to persist for longer and expectations are starting to shift. If people, if we see those series of data points arising, it would not be a total shock because the Fed would have been talking about that scenario as a possibility for some considerable time if they've been doing it smart. So absolutely, uh, central banks should be talking through these scenarios and not expressing policy paths and optimizations around a particular view of the world, which is most likely not to turn out. I, um, I have a bunch of questions for you, David, um, but, but for people in the audience, okay, um, I'm going to, uh, to try and, uh, and explain um, what a profound uh, impact uh, David has had on my thinking about these things and reflecting uh, about the past. Um, so some of these things that David is, is emphasized, uh, we, would, we would push, but I would say very unsuccessfully so. Um, so there's this little trap about oversimplifying things. And I think that's one of the things that David is, is trying to, to warn us about. Um, so, I mean, a good example would be like when people release forecasts, you know, the, there's too much message in the number, in the one unique number, like when the IMF releases its, its wheel you know, that, that one number as it rounds from 0.1 up, uh, it has, it seems to have too much of an impact. So it can be problematic when that's not sort of directly related to the story that you're trying to tell about what's going on in the, you know, in the world and, and so on. But another profound uh, implication of what he's saying is that there, you have to be really careful um, about building internal processes um, that oversimplify in ways that are going to come back and, and haunt you. So his example is, is forward guidance, stuff that we've written about that if you're just trying to talk Tom long-term bond deals down and you, you end up eliminating all of your term premium, then don't be surprised if, you're, if your unconventional policies are successful that there's going to come a day when there might be a rocky exit, especially if you haven't described what that what that exit might entail and so on, which is what David, I think, is is trying to tell us. But in addition to that, another example where you can draw an implication from what he's saying is whether or not uh, central banks should be consensus. Uh, you know, we create this committee, and the idea is that we're supposed to get better policies from committees than than from individuals for various reasons. One important reason being uh, that you depersonalize or you try to depersonalize monetary policy and so on. But then the problem is that if the committee thinks that they have to achieve a consensus to produce a forecast, now this is, this is really getting tricky because now uh, you're forcing people to come up with the most likely version of something, in this case, the economy, um, to justify um, the policy choices. And the problem is, is obviously if it takes time to do that, 
if, a, if it's problematic for a board to even think about those kinds of issues, technically. But more importantly, even if the board was highly skilled and could deal with the technical um, issues, it was still a very practical issue in the sense that if it takes time to do it, then a day before they, they've done this exercise of making everything consistent and there being you know, this baseline forecast that makes everything consistent, uh, what if something changed? So they won't have time now to, to build a consensus. And the reality will be that the people on that board will have different views about things. Now, if we think about it the way that David is trying to um, push us to think about these issues, um, it's almost like changing our culture uh, you can think about it on that kind of level. And then the question becomes, well, you know, can people, can they really understand it? Are they going to be able to, you know, is the reason that we have one scenario when forecast is that it's simple. You know, we start talking about multiples. Well, I, yes, it is to some extent, but I, I think is actually pretty, a pretty natural uh, progression because it's consistent with, I think, the way in which policy making is done. I mean, I've, been in the room so many times involved in the policy process. Um, in the case that I was involved in, there was a single decision maker which changes things, but think about the Fed and reflect on the transcripts uh, in terms of what we know goes on in the room, how people talk about the policy process. None of the individuals, individual decision makers are coming at the problem from a uh, forward-looking uh, optimization of the policy path using endogenous policy projections. So you don't get any alternative uh, views on which way the economy is going to evolve and which way the policy should go from that kind of a process. They're coming at it from uh, a much more intuitive sense about what's the nature of the risks they're going against and where, what's their preferences in terms of... of, uh, of um, setting the, the rates to avoid the sorts of problems that they're particularly worried about. With Powell, it's been worried about repeatedly anticipating a problem and setting interest rates or talking about setting interest rates as if this problem is going to arrive, but turning out it's not arrived. Uh, so he's, he's harked back to, uh, to Greenspan and others uh, when he's talking about this, describing the problems in, in policy making. Now, so you get all these decision makers coming in, not using this process, and then the staff using the process of forward-looking policy with endogenous policy projections. But their task now is to produce a projection with endogenous policy, which is consistent with where they expect the policy makers to come out on consensus from a completely different technology, from a completely different way of approaching things. So the consensus is guessed at, a consensus which is drawn from a mix of things not done in forward-looking policy analysis. The staff then come and produce an SCP with, with, uh, based on some degree of endogenous policy, but designed to um, achieve the consensus. So there's a terrible circularity about that. And, and, and it's, it's very uninformative analytically for anybody to get a sense of what's, what's, what's going to cause the, part, the, the Fed to shift path. This is the big advantage of laying out the uh, alternative scenarios. You can say what you can, by laying out alternative scenarios, you can say, what are the, 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 the policy makers worried about? And then your process of reading the data is, 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 is very much a process of which of the alternative scenarios that have been talked about is the one that looks most likely now to be evolving. Now, if it turns out that the concern about uh, another COVID shock, uh, continued lockdown of the economy is the one that's going to be the evolving one, it's already on the table. Nobody has to um, be shocked when, when the, the Fed's 
starts discussing that scenario actively. Likewise, if it turns out to be the other one, it's already on the table. Nobody has to be shocked. Markets already start anticipating it because it's the, it's the scenario which is now evolving. And so interest rates start adjusting, asset prices start adjusting, behavior starts adjusting in a policy consistent direction. The essential thing going on here by putting out the scenarios is you're focusing the discussion around the policy objective and you're illustrating how that policy objective is going to lead you to take different policy actions in different circumstances. You've told people how you're gonna react when this circumstance arises and when that circumstance arises. And so it's totally fine. There's no taper tantrum because there's no shock. You've already explained how you're gonna respond. It legitimizes um, the, the, um, the revelation of your uncertainty because it's focusing attention on the thing that you are certain about. You are certain that those are your objectives and that's what you're going to pursue. So just to be, so just to be clear, so, so if um, not having this framework, okay, results in miscommunications, okay, because so I get back to the story that I had about uh, unconventional forward guidance. So you just are trying to talk bond deals down, you're trying to stimulate the economy, and the term premium gets completely eliminated. Uh, and then it's not surprising that if you mention something that could be misinterpreted that that result in discontinuous behavior, uh, basically. Um, and so if you're if you buy that, you would say that there is a cost to, uh, from those shocks. Uh, uh, that's a result of a, are there a lack of trans, would you call it a lack of transparency or would you call it uh, not having the framework in place? I guess they're the same, but yeah, it's a bit of a mix of both. I mean, I think the I think that somehow this uh, the Fed's been driven into this corner where um, the dictionary of words, our, our, the lexicon we have to now interpret, has got even more opaque to the point where um, Powell was felt driven to say we're not even thinking about when we're going to start thinking about exit. This degree of circularity in a circumstance where other people say, ah, hang on, there are things going on, which uh, surely means you are thinking about the possibility of exit. And absolutely, there are policymakers in there thinking about it, the possibility of exit, at the same time as denying they're even thinking about it. The, the, um, the recipe for for taper tantrums is really um, clearly in place. Yeah, so, so the idea then is that words along with scenarios will be, uh, there's a better chance for people to understand, but, but you, you also have to admit that it's more complicated, right? So it assumes that people are willing to, invest to understand no i don't really think so i know it sounds more complicated because you're putting two or four stories out there mm -hmm. two or four because you are indeed avoiding a middle one and it sounds like you're multiplying up the storytelling that you have to do but as you're focusing on scenarios you're going to start removing for those Central banks like my own former central bank where forecast based communications is the thing, there's a huge amount of detail in the forecast story that you tell and people get lost with that amount of detail. The narrative disappears. It's kind of immersed by all of the detail. When you start telling scenarios, you're starting to focus more on the narrative. And the narratives are gonna be simple ones to tell. The simple one of where 
we're worried about being trapped near this lower bound where our policy instruments are less powerful and we're worried that we're not out of the COVID problem. And if we turn out to have an additional COVID problem, we would have to do the following things to keep um, the scenario, to keep the economy afloat. Simple stories to be able to tell, and you can, people who are policy wonks can go and look at the numbers associated with those scenarios, but the narratives are powerful. So the communication process, I think, is somehow simplified by being able to tell stories that resonate because they're going to be in people's minds. People are going to recognize their story because they are the relevant stories for the, for the, the range of policy problems being confronted. The story that sort of, as, as Shaba was explaining, the story that you have to tell to kind of reconcile um, economic developments with a policy path which looks really strange produces really odd storytelling. Yeah, you have to assume a neutral real interest rate, which is incredibly low, uh, even in circumstances where the economy is looks like it's, it's back on a growth path. Uh, you know, no longer in the, it's sort of a summer's world where you could perhaps justify a really low uh, equilibrium real interest rate. But you have to somehow tell a story that that includes these things and has these shocks to prices that immediately disappear because they're all base effects or they're all transitory. It gets a, to, gets to be very complicated. Simpler, I think, to tell the stories that are actually in people's minds, the ones that they're worrying about. I, sh I should say that, that David, um, uh, despite the fact that he's been gone from New Zealand for um, how long? Over a decade? Yeah, 15 years. I think he's still a little, there's still a bit of Kiwi there left. Um, and, I, and I say that because in New Zealand, it's possible to conceptualize things and to actually change things. Okay, so this is a... Um, um, yeah, I think that's right. I mean, the, uh, it's kind of institutional inertia is not nearly as strong in New Zealand as it is in the big countries. Uh, from the sitting in the, in the BIS and, and talking with central bankers around the world, that it's absolutely crystal clear that institutional inertia is a disease that affects the biggest of the big countries. So the smaller Georgia, other countries who don't have that problem, have the capability of modifying the way they're doing the policy analysis and policy communication. I think we're really a lot better off to move away from kind of over-promising, as you put it, over-promising futures, which we can't, we can't promise anything about because those futures are unknowable. So I would say, just to go back, so back to the, the history of institutions and so on, right? So the Fed really is a collection of regional banks, right? So there's a tremendous amount of history there, right? Um, and then there's a, from the regional banks, and then there, of course, there's the, the history of the board, okay? So there's a lot of, lot of history, a very complicated institution. Uh, now, what, if one was thinking about doing this, so there's a problem with the dot plot in the sense that they, well, there's a number of problems, but you don't know whose dot is who. Um, so you don't know whose GDP forecast is, who's fit. Yeah, there's no storylines in there because you can't connect the dots up. And even if you could connect the dots up, there's central view stories clustered around the narrow range of possibilities. They're not explorations of policy risks. So they're, they're, they're quite different. But if you're asking the question, how would you bring a, a scenario analysis process together in the context of a distributed policy um, process uh, where regional presidents come in and participate, many of them, not all of them, they all participate in the discussion, but not all of them are voting. How would you bring that together? Well, I think there's, the huge problem of institutional inertia, but just set that aside for the moment. The, 
one of the big advantages the Fed has is a lot of research hubs. Now, one of the um, crucial things about doing uh, effective scenario analysis is being able to play with different model structures and see what the implications for policy are of these different model structures. So either you're talking about a suite of models or well, you are talking about a suite of models, but in a, in a place where you have several research hubs that can play with different model structures, this provides kind of a, the wherewithal, the capacity to explore different states of the world and different, different um, calibrations of, of models and so on. So they, it, they, they like the, in principle, like the ESCB, the European um, System of Central Banks, have the numbers and uh, inherent structure to be able to get different teams to go off and explore the implications of different, different scenarios, different risks. Other people have to do that all in-house in the one team. Now, um, there's a danger in people thinking, well, you, do you need a structure as big as the Fed structure, as big as the ECB structure in order to do these things? No, I mean, you've, you've shown two, three scenarios and could easily have shown more, which you've created virtually single-handedly in a relatively short space of time. We've been talking about this for a couple of weeks. I mean, this is... This is not, once, once you've got um, a versatile enough um, base structure to work with and people who can conceptualize macroeconomic problems in model form, then it's not a difficult task. It doesn't require massive people and a distributed policy, um, a different distributed research uh, hub arrangement. Those are just luxuries. Yeah, in fact, if you look at the early inflation targeters, obviously because they didn't have a history of monetary policy, there wasn't people teaching monetary action. I mean, Chile, Canada, uh, New Zealand, um, <coughs> they, they, these are places which had pretty small teams. Uh, working on on developing um, the new policy strategy. Yeah. Um, so Shelva, so back to resources. Um, sorry to put you on the spot here, but um, how many people does it take in Georgia? I remember going there years and years ago, and it seemed like there was three people. Uh, th three people were doing it. Um, I I thought that was a little. A little small, um, so I re recommended that you increase it. But what does it increase to? How many people are there there, and what do they do? Yeah, indeed. So we were quite a small team, and uh, we took your advice and we increased the uh, the staff like uh, by thirty three percent. Now we're four. So now you're four. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we got units, units, units right too. Um, so why four? Uh, I mean, so uh, in general, the, the National Bank of Georgia uh, tries to be uh, more like, a, I don't want to say efficient because uh, other central banks uh, would do this uh, uh, as efficient as we do, but it's, it's like um, uh, we try to, uh, concentrate on the tasks that that the that is absolutely necessary. For example, like uh, uh, doing a research on a broader topics is uh, is a luxury for us because uh, uh, the staff is uh, so um, like uh, we're not as much as staffed as, as uh, other central banks. That's why we have to give up some uh, very interesting research topics. So we uh, have to this this uh, small team has to concentrate on the forecasting and. Uh, this, uh, as you call the projection and then policy analysis. So uh, we try to be uh, like a lean in, in terms of staff so that the central bank has aim to be as, uh, as uh, uh, small because uh, we, it's, it's like a general understanding in, in the public that the public institutions have to be 
uh, efficient so that the resources, the taxpayers' resources are spent wisely. So that's kind of a general idea to be as effective as possible. And uh, that's why it's like a general direction to be, to, to have as a small team as possible. Of course, uh, not, uh, it, it should not be at the expense of the core tasks of the central bank. But uh, these, these four people, I think uh, they are up to the challenge and uh, we, we didn't have uh, much uh, problem uh, with uh, uh, this, this process of uh, projection and, and policy analysis. So just go back to the New Zealand example. Um, so it took New Zealand, I think three years from when the project was conceptualized to uh, developing the, the forecasting and policy analysis system. Um, we then moved to the Czech Republic and, uh, and did it in two years, okay? Um, and then there was one country where we actually did it in one year, but, but I'm just curious, it'd be really interesting to have some research, David, that looked at mm. you know, what central bank resources, like what resources are actually necessary? What types of resources are necessary to, to actually fill out the entire roster to be a competent, flexible inflation targeting uh, central bank. Yeah, I think that's um, a fascinating project, which is so politically um, dangerous. <laughs> it's not going to fly. I mean, it's politically dangerous in the sense that I think Shalva just highlighted it. You can, you can do the core job with just a handful of good people once they're thinking in the right framework. Once you're thinking about what is the understanding the nature of the task and recruiting the right people. I mean, it's critical if you have a small team to have the right human capital. Now, the, the, the obvious implication of that is that the add-ons are low return add-ons. So as you get, as you go from four to 20 to 100, um, if it turns out that you can do it with four, what are the 96 doing? Backups. Is, uh, backups, yes. I mean, so you can see why it's politically kind of an awkward, um, awkward issue to, uh, to tackle. No, I don't. I think if it was done correctly, um, it doesn't have to be politically charged. You could just say, because what you're saying in words is that it only takes four, okay? Um, and then after that, so to get the major gains in productivity and efficiency, you need four. And then after that, the additional person, you know, is gonna, presumably if they truly are backups, you have another four that are backing up the four, right? And then, you know, they're pretty stressful jobs. And then you ask, well, what's the efficiency of going beyond the four? So you, you can then multiply this. Yeah, system. I mean, yeah, you, you, you do release um, some opportunity for people to do other research projects, uh, things that Shalva can't do. Um, interesting questions, which are also sort of, um, in some senses, non pecuniary rewards for being in, involved in the central bank. You can come and you have time to do um, policy research or non-policy research, which is interesting on the side. So you do, you get, clearly you're going to get benefits, benefits from that. The other angle to um, recognize here is that, and this is an example we've got right now, is that networking globally with people who are doing similar things um, really produces potentially massive efficiency gains, really allows you to leverage up on uh, individual contributions fantastically. So consider a Shabba's problem, which at the, at the moment is that um, you're having, you're gonna have to think about how are you going to model the scenarios where Fed funds have to go to 4% in a hurry uh, in circumstances where the exchange rate is going to respond in different ways, as you noted, the, the, the character of the exchange rate response is going to depend on the way in which the Fed uh, un unwraps the, the policy adjustment. Um, you're also going to have to think about um, modeling the um, scenario in which 
COVID returns. Um, the US locks down again. Um, politics means there's no more fiscal space or if there's fiscal space, it can't be used um, and, and, and things slip back into a bad hole. Because these are the, these are the kind of alternative worlds. Um, add, add a couple of European-centric scenarios, which are also potentially pretty interesting for Georgia. Um, these are the worlds that your policy makers are going to have to confront, potentially, and having pre-thought what's the sort of policy responses which make sense in those worlds would be hugely valuable. Now, some of the questions are going to be, how do we, how do we model that one? You know, we're thinking, we're thinking about some of the, um, the scenarios which are not yet well rehearsed, well understood. As Doug said, there's a couple there which you haven't spent a lot of time on. How do you think it through, and what kind of what kind of adjustments to model processes would you need in order to handle some of these shocks? Talking this around with colleagues in other places has the potential to solve these problems massively faster than trying to do it in house. Witness, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Welcome. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so I, I have a question for David. Um, so I'm sort of hung up on this uh, uh, argument around uh, why we should sort of move away from forecasting and sort of look at scenario projections. Uh, so, so is it the, is the, the big issue here the fact that uh, when you do forecast, usually you have a baseline, which means you are maybe subjectively uh, sort of apportioning probabilities uh, to different scenarios where the baseline is a scenario, but it's just a scenario with a high sort of probability mass. Uh, uh, because usually I think, uh, at least in our, in our case, we, when we do the forecasting, there's this baseline scenario, then there are at least maybe two alternative scenarios. Uh, and, and usually the alternative scenarios are low probability scenarios. Uh, so I just wanted to get a sense from you of whether uh, you, you still think that is not are going to give you the kind of uh, uh, ability to assess uh, sort of policy risks uh, that you would get with uh, not assigning any probability to any of the scenarios. Thank you. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, I think one of the things which is going on is we tend to think about, um, about the projections of futures as, and, and assigning probabilities as, as dealing with um, a confidence surface which has got quite high peaks in it. So the, the, the baseline forecast or the baseline projection we settle on, we kind of imagine has distinctly higher probability mass. The, the, the peak of the confidence surface is distinctly higher than the surrounding terrain. When, however, you go back and look at the evidence in terms of our ability to predict uh, what's coming, our ability to even understand what shocks are currently in the system still being worked through, our ability to understand the economic responses, the behaviours of the agents out there, it's not at all clear that we have a very peaked confidence surface at all. The, the, the probability mass associated with uh, these high probability scenarios are not that much greater than the probability mass associated with some of the other ones. Um, think about the ones that, that um, we talked about today that Doug went through the sharp recovery as people spend uh, resources that they've put aside because they've been doubtful and concerned about the future and if they become confident about the future, given the amount of stimulus that's in the system and is still in the system, it's, it's not something which I would describe as a low probability outcome. That, that scenario unfolds. But I'm equally conscious of 
Powell's concern that uh, we've repeatedly got that story wrong. We thought that was going to happen right from the beginning of um, the response to the, 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 the great financial crisis, where we're loaded up on policy stimulus and worried about that's got to turn out to economic recovery and, and inflation surge, but repeatedly got it wrong. And we know that COVID surprised us repeatedly. We think we, 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 we're seeing evidence of uh, sharp increases in infection rates, notwithstanding uh, good, um, increasingly good rates of vaccination. So that, that scenario, I wouldn't describe that as a low probability scenario. But the policy responses that you would adopt in these different worlds, equally plausible worlds, are dramatically different. And that's, I think, the essence of uh, the problem that the policymakers are going to confront. They've got to steer a path somewhere. They've got to make a choice, which gives them flexibility to adjust course and provides them with uh, a vehicle for explaining the policy choices in ways which are not going to lead to massive surprises when one of these um, very different scenarios turns out. The, avoiding the, 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 the taper tantrum problem, avoiding the shock to markets problem, harnessing the uh, ability of markets to read incoming data and its consistency with the alternative scenarios, I think gives you much more of a, um, a, much, a much healthier engagement in the discussion with the public. So I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, witness, I think that was a really good question about trying to figure out what it is we're talking about here. But um, so it's a story about a central bank where they basically, you know, had a confidence band that was mapped into a multivariate distribution and they had this procedure about how they would update it and stuff like that. And then they ran into a real world issue and the policymakers asked, how was it constructed? And then they said, well, please throw that in the garbage and burn it and don't do anything like that ever again. So, um, so if you cross the line doing technical analysis, okay, where it becomes, you know, absurd and it becomes a part of the culture to just repeat that absurd analysis, then it's going to be an example of oversimplification. So I think from listening to David, he likes to use the word projection. So this is a very important change in the culture because it sort of implies uh, conditions attached to it, which means that your language in terms of producing us for, you know, describing a scenario would be that I've assumed these things to generate this particular scenario, implying that those things are uncertain. Okay. So, and that's a little bit different than than just telling people that our forecast is gonna con, is gonna con, you know is converging to target, and we should just believe too. That's a that's a different communication strategy. It's more complicated, and obviously it's gonna run into trouble sometimes, and it'll benefit other things sometimes. But but so then there's the other kind times witness where you simply just have no clue how to write down uh, probabilistic statements. Like, and that's David's example of, you know, during COVID, right? Like how the hell do you wait um, the, the probabilities of when the vaccine is going to be discovered and when it's going to be uh, implemented. And, uh, and of course, what's the, the uncertainty of the virus uh, mutating and uh, I mean, it's just a, there's massive uncertainty. <clears throat> so at some point you have to simplify it. And the question is, do you oversimplify it? Is that accurate, David, or? or... Yeah. So there's a cost of yeah. oversimplifying it. Yeah. 
Cost did not simplify. The, the, the only tweak I would make to what you said is that in, 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 <clears throat> as you're generating these projections, I would just add the phraseology that what you're doing is you're exploring how policy would work in different circumstances. It's the exploration part of it. You're projecting for the sake of exploring the policy problems that you might confront. Some of those are were going to be revealed to be things which you, you, you find just horrible possibilities that you would absolutely want to avoid. And continuing near the effective lower bound is possibly one of those. So uh, it may well be that in the in the back of the, well, in the in the heads of the FOMC decision makers, which we will re see revealed in the transcripts eventually, we're going to find that people are worried about the takeoff and the loss of credibility and the need to recover credibility, but they're just not as worried about that as continuing in this horrible place near the effective lower bound. And while they're, they're kind of, there's a big tension between these concerns, what comes out of the communication process is a sort of uh, bizarre nonchalance about things are just going to roll along and it'll all turn out okay faith-based monetary policy, which we want to move beyond. So do you want to wrap it up or um, with the conclusion? I, I, I think that's pretty much yeah. what's on the screen is pretty much what we've been saying. And, and I think the, um, the, the move away from what appears to be either have faith uh, or equivalently just trust us we'll do the right thing um, this is not a great way of communicating honestly or effectively with the community and it doesn't help markets um, it doesn't harness the markets to work for you to do early implementation of the policy adjustments as the data unfolds so moving away from faith-based monetary policy towards scenario-based explorations of the policy problems in different worlds, I think is a lot going for it. Thanks. Um, I'd like to thank Shelva. I sent him from my program, I think yesterday, um, saying, I think, I think it's gonna be, you should look at this little model. Um, it might help you think about some things, some issues that are, I think are worth thinking about. But um, so, I, but I was very impressed that he, that he used his evenings to get into it and come back with such uh, insights. Um, to repay you, Shalva, um, next week, we'll have a two country version of the model that I'll send to you where it helps you think about the think through the exchange rate implications, okay? Because it's, there's some interesting things there where signs can switch, even using standard theory and so on. But, um, but back to David, uh, thank you uh, very much. Um, I have enjoyed uh, working with you on this project. Uh, it's got me to reflect uh, about a lot of things um, and I think, I think we're on to something that we might be going in the, in the right direction, which is always a, always a good sign. Okay. So thank you. Um, well, thanks for the opportunity. It's great fun. And thanks everybody. See you guys. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a very interesting discussion. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.